This is a demonstration of the restoration and overhaul of a 1963 Chevrolet Biscayne rear differential. The differential uh, from this vehicle uh, that we have over here uh, has a set of 456 uh, gears in it. Uh, the owner of the vehicle wants to switch to some uh, 336 gears for a little more pleasability while driving down the, the freeway. And so this video is going to document the overhaul procedures to uh, restore this 1963 Chevrolet rear differential uh, back to its um, proper uh, condition. Um, the owner of the vehicle, uh, Mr. Fultz, has um, given us a 1961 Chevrolet manual uh, to use, which I've photocopied pages from so I can write on them and get them dirty. And um, the, uh, Apparently this differential style was used from uh, the early 50s up through about 1965. And then after that they went to the non-removable uh, differential housing um, where you have to remove the complete uh, differential case with the ring gear uh, by itself rather than the entire uh, housing. So this, uh, this rear differential is, it is a General Motors uh, rear differential, but it, it's unlike what most people have seen because it does have the adjustable uh, side bearing uh, spacers and that's typically something that you would see on a, a Ford or um, older uh, Chryslers and uh, obviously older uh, General Motors vehicles. Uh, Toyota, Nissan, and, and others still use this uh, design today. Um, but this was a General Motors uh, design uh, way back uh, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, if not uh, before, I don't know the complete history. But uh, this uh, differential is in a fairly decent shape. Uh, we're going to be replacing all the bearings, seals, uh, crush sleeve, and setting up uh, the pinion depth and all the bearing preloads and contact pattern and everything uh, as we should. The uh, Marking here on the side, uh, it's got a 19, 11 of 1962 uh, build date on it right here for the 1963 uh, Biscayne that it's out of. Uh, whoever put the 456 uh, set of gears uh, in it, um, they had to use a spacer between the differential case and the ring gear to move the ring gear over far enough because the pinion gear that we can't see uh, down inside there is so small for a set of 456 gears that this differential case uh, wouldn't have the ring gear over far enough to even come in contact with the, the pinion gear. Uh, as you may notice, this has a, um, a pause attraction uh, differential gear set. It is not an open differential gear set. This has a special pause attraction gear set, and the owner has um, given us an overhaul kit uh, obtained from Spicer for this. So we're going to replace the clutches um, and set the, uh, the, the side gear backlash and everything correctly uh, to get that pause attraction set up properly. Uh, in the service manual, I copied this, the page that shows the special service tools. And here are the special service tools required for this uh, vehicle. Uh, as it turns out, we had about half of the original special service tools. Some of them are still used today on modern axles and others haven't been used for uh, quite a while. But um, I'm going to be using all the original uh, tools uh, that we have and then we have obviously more, more modern uh, substitutes or substitutes, not necessarily more modern, uh, for the other tools uh, that we are uh, missing. And then um, looking at, just looking at the, the supplies here to complete this project, uh, as I mentioned, we've got uh, from Spicer right here, 
a set of uh, pause attraction uh, clutch discs. So we've got the four outer and the four inner and then the, the spring washers that we're going to be replacing those. Uh, we also have, um, looks like from Show Cars Automotive, uh, the uh, a complete overhaul kit uh, with the pinion bearings, the side bearings, the crush sleeve, the pinion seal, the ring gear, uh, new bolts and, and lock washers, uh, a set of selective shims for the pinion depth, uh, some contact uh, pattern grease and a new uh, pinion lock nut. And then uh, right here looks like from Nitro Gears also through uh, show cars we've got a set of uh, 3.36 to 1 uh, ring and pinion uh, gears here uh, for this vehicle along with their uh, instruction uh, kit. So we are going to be um, as I mentioned overhauling and restoring this this axle uh, housing and we are going to uh, clean and sandblast and repaint uh, the, the housing and then set everything up properly. Um, I have a modern uh, differential holding fixture here. This is actually a kind of a universal holding fixture that I've used in other um, videos. It, you can bolt whatever you want to it, but this is an OTC, let's see if we can focus on that there, 7020 is the part number from OTC Tools and you can buy this kit that comes with the bench fixture and these uh, this arm set here that goes in here and it has holes that allow it to um, rotate in 90 degree increments um, but we also have the old original General Motors uh, Kentmore special tool uh, holding fixture Here's the bench fixture right here. It has a hole here and a couple of uh, wing nuts that are going to go in here that allow the original factory um, special service tool to also rotate into uh, 90 degree increments. So this, this tool right here slides into that uh, hole on the, or that fixture on the bench and we've got these bronze uh, clamps here and we are going to actually clamp the differential housing into this holding fixture and then slide it into that fixture on the bench uh, and that will allow us to rotate this thing around without having to wrestle it uh, on the bench. So I'm going to get that set up in the uh, I'm going to get the, the differential housing set up into this holding fixture and then we'll proceed from there. Okay, we've got this uh, differential housing uh, mounted in the proper uh, holding fixture. Uh, this holding fixture, as you can see, uh, the blue part, uh, slides into this red bench fixture where we've got a thumb screw that goes into a slot that prevents this whole housing uh, carrier from sliding out and then this other thumb screw uh, screws into four different notches that allow us to rotate this whole uh, housing assembly in 90 degree increments to um, do whatever service procedures we need to do. So one of the first things um, I like to do when overhauling a uh, rear axle, front axle, doesn't matter, uh, is to do some inspections on the disassembly. And one of the first things uh, we're going to do on this uh, differential is measure um, the total turning preload. So I'm going to turn this housing over. We're going to put a torque wrench on the, on the pinion nut and we're going to uh, rotate the pinion gear and the ring gear and get what's called a total turning preload measurement and that'll give us the preload on the pinion bearings and the preload on the side bearings um, divided by the gear ratio of 4.56 on the side bearings um, to see if it was set up properly uh, to begin with or maybe we have some bad bearings. I can tell just right off the bat uh, turning it that it, it isn't going to have much preload at all if any. It feels to me like almost zero. 
So we'll turn this thing over and get a, a torque wrench on it and find out. Okay, we've got the differential housing turned over. I've got the pinion flange uh, pointing up. We've got a one and one eighth inch uh, socket that'll fit this uh, pinion nut. And I've got a dial style uh, inch pound torque wrench. This measures from zero to 30 inch pounds. And if you recall, there's 12 inch pounds in one foot pound. So this does not even measure three foot pounds. Uh, it's a very delicate and very precise low torque um, tool. And they're, they're fairly expensive too. They're around $300. Uh, but if you're doing a lot of axle uh, work where you need bearing preloads to be very precise, then this is what you need uh, for accuracy. Um, this uh, tool um, has a max indicator built into it. So there's a white or this silver dial here that I can move back and forth. That, I'll put that right up against the needle and that will record the maximum uh, torque that was reached, the rotational torque that was reached as we uh, turn this tool. That way we don't have to look at it and try to figure out what was the highest torque because the, the red needle on there will just move the, the silver needle uh, to as high as it'll uh, go and then we can just look at where the silver needle points. And the scale we're going to use uh, with this tool is the black uh, scale with the white writing uh, on the face there. So not this outer one, but the one in the middle there. That's uh, inch pounds of uh, torque. So I'm going to uh, put this uh, socket adapter and torque wrench up on here and rotate it a full turn uh, at least. And feel, we want to feel how the bearing, bearings feel. They're nice and smooth. Uh, don't feel any bad uh, bearings. When I lift this off, um, in looking at that silver scale there, zoom in here a little bit, it got clear up to three inch pounds of total, total rotational torque. Now three inch pounds is nowhere near enough. Uh, the specification for the pinion bearing preload alone is six to seven for a used bearing and 12 to 15 for a new bearing. Uh, and then we would have um, the side bearing preload uh, on top of that, that here should probably add another three to five uh, inch pounds on top of what the, the pinion should be. So <clears throat> both, this tells me that both the pinion bearing preload is too low and the side bearing preload uh, is too low, too low, which on a 1963 axle, uh, if those bearings have never been changed, I'm, I'm sure they're worn out and that has led to a low preload uh, value or possibly they were not set up properly uh, when it was installed. Um, the crush sleeve has to be uh, properly utilized to get the pinion bearing uh, preload set properly and then the adjustable sleeves on the side to get the uh, side bearing preload uh, and backlash uh, set up properly. So now uh, we are going to uh, start the disassembly procedure uh, of this axle. Okay, uh, to begin the disassembly procedure, I'm going to use a paint marker and mark the side bearing caps uh, to make sure that we get the, the right cap on the right side. Uh, looks like there's a factory uh, paint mark right there anyway. I'm just going to put a single stripe on this side and two stripes on this other side just so there's no confusion um, when I go back together. Uh, it looks like someone who's worked on this before has put a, a single punch mark on the top and the bottom over here to avoid confusion and there's dual punch marks on this other side. So there's several ways to do it. Uh, the next thing we're supposed to do is take off these lock nuts, uh, locking uh, tangs here for the adjustable um, side bearing spacer. 
uh, there's a, a spanner wrench that goes in here and this whole thing rotates to move the uh, bearings in and out to adjust backlash and uh, bearing preload. And uh, so we're taking those off just with a half inch uh, socket and keep track of which one's right, which one's left. In comparing them, they look the same, so I'm not too worried about, about that. Uh, the next thing is to remove the side bearing caps, three quarter inch uh, hand wrench or ratchet here. We'll get those loosened up. Make sure they feel good. Uh, some techs will grab a, an impact gun at this point and shoot those out of there, but I've seen where there were some threads that were buggered up a little bit, and if you just give it a big uh, impact shot, uh, it can bugger up the threads. Plus, if you loosen them by hand, initially, um, you can get a sense of how evenly were they torqued. Uh, all of those felt about the same. Uh, we don't want to have one that's, that's too tight uh, or uh, too loose. So let me get those uh, bolts out. Okay, we're uh, taking those side bearing cap bolts out, uh, keep track of which side uh, they go on. And then we're supposed to take a uh, hammer and lightly tap because there's some dowels that hold these uh, side bearing caps in place. Um, looks like there are no dowels on this one, um, but we've got the threads of the threaded adjuster here that thread in and we, got, we need to be careful uh, uh, with those. Let's see if there's any dowels on this side. No. But it almost looks like moisture uh, has been in there, but uh, I don't see any signs of, of rust. Now, at, at this point, these threaded adjusters sh um, will probably uh, be very tight on an axle that's set up properly and you'll have to uh, use a, a spanner wrench to loosen those up but uh, as you can see I can just turn turn those and that relieves the pressure on the side bearings and then that allows us to lift the entire uh, differential case this is the case this is the housing uh, lift this entire differential case out and we're gonna lose some bearings if we're not careful so we'll set that off to the side here keeping track of which bearing uh, race went with on on which side and then these threaded adjusters also inspecting the threads to make sure that there's no damage looking at down in the the housing itself make sure there's no damage uh, there to the threads um, interesting there's some severe uh, grinding that's uh, taking place on this axle I'm not sure if that's out of the factory or somebody's modified it uh, for uh, possible clearance no that, that's on the other side well anyway here's our uh, little tiny uh, pinion gear as you can see down here and now that we've got the differential case out we can turn this housing over and uh, lock it in place and then check that preload again so remember uh, when we measured preload before we had three inch pounds of preload I'm going to reset the maximum dial on the on the uh, torque wrench here and what we want to find out is how much do we have now with just the pinion so I'm rotating that around um, taking it off uh, looking at it it looks like all three inch pounds of rotation were due to the pinion preload which meant 
if you do the math, <laughs> if we had three with the differential case and the side bearings in with the pinion, and now we still have three with just the pinion, how much preload did we have on the side bearings? None. There, were, there was no preload on those side bearings. Uh, with, with no preload on the side bearings, the entire differential case with the ring gear on it uh, would be able to, as, as it rotates, would be flopping back and forth. Uh, under acceleration, the, the ring gear teeth would be pushing themselves away from the pinion gear teeth. But on deceleration, they would be pulling themselves together, and that's because we did not have enough preload on these bearings. And the, the preload is the, how much squish, uh, how much force um, we're putting on these bearings. We need to come in and compress them, uh, which actually stretches, spreads this axle housing out. Uh, you've heard of axle uh, housing spreaders for some Dana axles. Well, they don't spread these. Uh, and then drop the bearings and shims in like they do on Dana's. Uh, instead, they drop it in with no preload and then tighten those threaded uh, uh, spacers until it puts a certain amount of preload uh, on the bearings. Well, you can't just keep tightening without also spreading uh, this case. So this axle was not set up properly. Uh, in, in, in inspecting the, uh, the bearings, it does have some uh, brenoline and uh, flaking taking place, so that bearing is failing. That could e explain for some of the uh, bearing preload fault. Uh, this bearing, same thing. Uh, it's got some, um, got some irregular uh, spots on it. Zoom in so you can see that. Out just a tiny bit. I don't know if you can see those regularly spaced spots there. It could just be surface rust from the vehicle sitting uh, for a long time. Uh, this vehicle is a show car and is not driven uh, very often. And if moisture was in here, uh, it could have um, led to some rusting there. Um, but a little piece. Uh, will flake off and then uh, it'll roll around and get chewed up and then another piece will flake off. It's kind of like having a crack in a road. Um, the more people that drive over it, the bigger that crack becomes and pretty soon it's a pothole. And that's pretty much how these bearings uh, tend to fail also. So I guess I should not say this axle was not set up properly. It may have been as far as preload but with the bearings um, failing, um, it has reduced uh, the preload significantly. Uh, so we are going to replace uh, those bearings, of course. And uh, the next thing we need to do is to remove the pinion gear uh, itself. So. Um, I need to get a, a special holding fixture on the pinion flange so that we can get that nut off of there because we do not use impact guns to remove pinion nuts. Um, if you do, uh, it slams the gear back and forth, the gears, the, the pinion gear against the ring gear and can damage the uh, gears. It can also damage uh, the bearings. Okay, we are ready to remove the pinion nut uh, from the flange and to get that off without using an impact gun uh, it requires some sort of a holding fixture. Now this tool right here is a very old tool but you can still buy it from Kentmore Tools. Uh, it's a uh, part number Eighty six fourteen uh, J eight six one four, and there, this tool comes with this piece and with this polar attachment uh, that goes with it. And if you look on the the front of this uh, or the top side of this holding fixture, 
it just has uh, two notches in it, but if we turn it over, it has the two notches plus four more notches, and that's for this threaded puller. Once you have this uh, bolted to the flange, so we're going to put it to the flange, we're going to bolt it to the flange right there, that'll hold the flange from turning, and then with the nut removed, we will stick this puller, this threaded uh, puller adapter down in, turn it a quarter turn to lock it in place. And let me turn that over so you can see. Um, you'll notice it, it's free, but it can lock itself in place and then we can turn the, the center shaft um, with this on the pinion and it'll pull the flange right off of the pinion without hitting the pinion with a hammer. Um, so this is a holding fixture to remove the nut and has the puller attachment. This is all one piece. It's not that expensive. I think it's like a hundred bucks for both of these pieces combined. But it'll, it's cheaper than a, a couple of flanges. Uh, if you're hitting it with a hammer, you, know, you should not be hitting those with, with a hammer. So, but we're not ready for the puller yet. We're, so we'll set that off to the side. But we are ready for the um, holding fixture to go on. So I've just got a couple of bolts. We're going to stick through the U-bolt holes for the U-joints um, and then just a couple of uh, nuts on the other side. These do not have to be super tight, uh, just finger tight is all because it's a sideways load that we're going to put on these. Um, so I'm just going to snug that up there and then I'll put one on the other side over here and I've, I've used this tool for years it's a wonderful tool um, it does it's it's long enough that up underneath the vehicle this can swing over and and hit a leaf spring or the underbody of the vehicle as you're loosening the nut so you really don't need two hands uh, or two people to loosen the nut if you're not using an impact but as I said, you should not be using uh, an impact. Um, you should just be using a, a regular socket. So we've got our socket there. I've got my uh, half inch long ratchet here. And we'll see if we can loosen that up. And yeah, sure enough, uh, it's, it's not very tight. Uh, this bolt or this nut is never torqued to a specific torque, this nut is tightened until there's a specific rotational torque on the, um, or as, we, as I just showed you a little while ago, measuring the rotational torque uh, to turn the pinion. However, this nut uh, should have given us a little more resistance to come off. Um, it is a lock nut and they are not reusable, but this one has certainly been reused. Uh, and a lot of times there is a flat washer down underneath there um, and it looks like there's some RTV down underneath there also which some sort of sealant is good to put around uh, the splines of the um, pinion gear so that we don't get oil weeping up through. So now I'm going to take this threaded adapter that's part of this tool I'm going to stick it down in onto the pinion gear and turn the housing just a little bit there we go and lock it into place there we go and this will act as a puller and normally you would have to have a wrench on here to remove this but I'm pushing it <laughs> I'm just turning it by hand and the pinion gear underneath is actually falling out. So here's the, the pinion that fell out from underneath. Here's the old crush sleeve, the pinion bearing, and it looks like there's a shim under there for the pinion depth. I, I can't tell for sure. Um, in looking at the contact pattern uh, on this uh, pinion, um, it is not an even pattern, so I don't think the contact pattern was right. It's uh, real heavy uh, on the heel. 
um, on the drive side. So now we've got this, <laughs> we've got the pinion out. We can just simply lift the, the pinion flange up, but normally that would have, that puller would have lifted the flange. The pinion gear would have stayed in the bearing and uh, we would have had to have driven the pinion gear out uh, with a, uh, a brass hammer. So now we've got the uh, pinion seal, the front pinion uh, bearing uh, up inside here, and we need to remove uh, those next. Okay, uh, to remove a pinion seal like this, I normally just use a long uh, pry bar, uh, reach in deep underneath as far as I can, and then just give it a, a hard Smack, but uh, this one seems to be in uh, pretty well. So we... there we go. So we got that out. We have a replacement seal. Uh, this seal, as uh, you may be able to see, um, is it's in pretty pretty good shape. Of course, before I uh, put the pry bar on it, but. Notice it still has the girdle spring uh, behind the seal, which we need the girdle spring there to put a squeeze on the, on the seal um, to, so it won't leak. Uh, a lot of technicians, when they drive in the new seal, will knock that spring loose inside, and they might look inside and see that spring and think, what is that, and not realize that they've just knocked out uh, the seal, and it's, it's uh, knocked out its ability to actually seal uh, oil from leaking out. So there's our old seal. Here's our front pinion bearing. And uh, I don't see any obvious damage to that. And remember, we did have three uh, inch pounds of rotational torque on that pinion. And so looking at the bearing cup, I can see damage. Uh, it looks like it's damaged from the vehicle just sitting. Uh, evenly spaced um, pits uh, to where it, it's been uh, sitting for a long time and some corrosion uh, has taken place. And then uh, let's look at the other side. We haven't had this axle housing turned upside down since we removed the pinion. Let's flip that over, lock that into place, take a look at the other bearing here, the bearing cup. And it also has very similar uh, damage from sitting. And the damage is on the bottom rather than the top. And that's, of course, where um, the uh, moisture would uh, condense is down at the, the bottom there. So proper venting of the axle is important also. You need to make sure your axle vent is not blocked so that any moisture that's inside of these can um, work its way out. All right, the next thing uh, we're going to do is drive out both of these uh, pinion bearing races uh, so we can uh, clean up this axle housing. We're actually going to, going to sandblast it, uh, paint it, and get it ready to uh, reassemble. We'll, we'll let the paint be drying while we're over here working on this uh, pause attraction uh, differential set. Uh, along with uh, doing some inspections and, and changing of the uh, ring gear because if you recall we're taking out the 456 gear ratio gear set and putting in the 336 so that'll uh, slow the uh, engine down as you drive uh, down the freeway give a little better fuel economy but not quite as much uh, acceleration and uh, torque but 456 gears those are some <laughs> those are some low gears um, you would not want to be driving down the freeway very long uh, with those, especially with short tires. So we're going to drive those bearing cups out next. Okay, so we're going to remove the uh, pinion bearing cups because we're going to replace them. Uh, the service information, the, the, the old service manual tells us to use a brass drift to knock those out. And so I'm going to come in with the brass drift uh, along with the brass hammer and knock out the uh, front pinion 
race. There it goes across the floor. And we'll turn this thing over and knock out the rear pinion race also. Just want to get on the back side of the, the bearing cup the best you can. And on the other side. And there it goes. Across the floor also. Now we're going to, since we're replacing those, uh, we're going to not worry about those hitting the floor. Uh, new bearings, though, we would not want those dropping down and hitting the floor. Now, uh, when you get those out, we want to inspect the housing where the bearing cups ride for any type of damage. I don't see any, I don't see any damage uh, on this front bore and on the back bore here. I don't see any damage either. Sometimes damage can occur when somebody drives a bearing in. Uh, on an angle and it gets all bound up. Uh, also, if a bearing has seized and has spun in the bore, uh, that can uh, cause damage. Also, it can make the hole too big and then the bearing cup won't stay solid uh, as the pinion uh, bearing uh, rotates. All right, we are ready to take this housing out of the um, holding fixture and wash it in the solvent tank uh, we'll take it to the sandblaster, get it all uh, cleaned up, and then uh, spray it with uh, the, the, our uh, vehicle owners brought some um, black uh, glossy uh, spray paint in that we'll spray the housing with to match the rest of his uh, rear axle. And uh, then be letting that dry and work on the uh, positive traction uh, differential gear set here. Okay, uh, I have sandblasted this uh, differential housing and um, it's ready to paint. Uh, there's just a couple of uh, things I wanted to point out on it. Uh, first, if you look closely down here, you can see this housing was cast in 11 of 62, so that's November of 62. Uh, L is probably uh, the, the day of the month or maybe a shift. Here's the part number of this housing and of course it's a GM uh, axle. I do not know what the T5 indicates. On the other side we have some interesting uh, stampings. Uh, there seems to be a BW right there and then 1220 and then an A up there. A might be the A body uh, that this vehicle is. Uh, BW and 1220, uh, I don't know uh, what those mean either. Could be uh, whoever set this up and, and at a time or a, a date. Uh, this could be uh, December 20th when this housing was actually set up where it was cast in November of uh, 62. Um, it would make sense that in, on December 20th this thing was uh, put together and probably by somebody with the initials of BW for the A body uh, car. So we're going to uh, paint this next. I was careful not to sandblast uh, the inside here. We don't want to sandblast any bearing races um, or uh, threads so that uh, we don't uh, damage anything and I still need to get the RTV off of the the surface here where a gasket should go, a dry gasket. So we will get this painted and call it quits for today and we'll start on uh, uh, the uh, pause attraction uh, assembly, disassembly and overhaul um, on the next day.